Hey folks, in this video we'll be talking about how to determine the solution resistance in your electrochemical cell, specifically looking at the solution resistance between the working and the reference electrode, sometimes referred to as the uncompensated solution resistance. In our previous video, we talked about what is IR drop and how a potentiostat can compensate for the IR drop in your electrochemical cell. Well, to use the IR compensation circuit in your potentiostat, you need to know what the solution resistance is, which is what this video is about. This video is broken up into several sections. We'll first review the Randall circuit from our IR drop video, as that will help us set the framework for making solution resistance measurements. We'll then go over the following techniques that are used for measuring the solution resistance electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, current interrupt, potential step, and positive feedback. Lastly, we will have a brief discussion about overcompensation. Timestamps are in the description below. And lastly, before we begin, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. First, let's start off by reviewing the Randall circuit from our IR drop video. Of course, if you've watched our IR drop video already, you can skip ahead. But by understanding the Randall circuit, we'll have a better understanding of how the measurements for determining the solution resistance actually work. So in our Randall circuit, the working electrode interface is modeled as a resistor and a capacitor in parallel, where the capacitor, CDL, represents the electrical double layer, and the resistor, RCT, represents the charge transfer resistance. Now, between the working and reference electrode, there is another resistor, RU, which represents the uncompensated solution resistance. And it is this RU, this uncompensated solution resistance, that we are ultimately interested in determining. So every technique that we will talk about from this point on has to do with solving for RU. So the first technique that we'll talk about is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, or EIS for short. EIS is one of the most complicated techniques in all of electrochemistry, and I probably can't give you a full description of EIS for just a video on determining the solution resistance. However, we will go over a variety of DC-based techniques to determine the solution resistance. But if you're interested in learning more about EIS, we have a full YouTube video about what is EIS and how does it work, as well as a written article on the subject and some advanced webinars on EIS. So I would encourage you to check that out to learn more about EIS. Now, if you are more familiar with EIS, EIS is a very powerful tool for determining the solution resistance because EIS is literally measuring the impedance. It literally measures the resistance. In our Randall circuit, when performing EIS at high frequencies, our capacitor, CDL, will start to act like a short circuit. If you look at the impedance equation for a capacitor, 1 over J omega C, you will find that as the frequency, omega, increases, the impedance decreases. So EIS experiments done at very high frequencies treats the capacitor like a short circuit, like it's just a line in our Randall circuit. So the path that current will take will not be through the charge transfer resistance. It'll go through the capacitor as if it had no resistance at all. And the only resistance that you will measure is the solution resistance, RU, the uncompensated solution resistance. So EIS can measure the uncompensated solution resistance by taking high-frequency EIS data. Now, not all potentiostats have EIS capabilities, and EIS functionality is a bit more expensive. So there are plenty of DC techniques that can be used to determine the solution resistance. One such technique is current interrupt. In the current interrupt technique, a potentiostat will apply a constant current to the electrochemical system, and we measure the potential. The potentiostat will then disconnect the counter electrode from the system, giving you a graph that looks something like this, where you see a sudden drop in the potential, followed by a slow and gradual decay. 
Now this gradual decay in the potential is due to the discharging of the capacitor CDL. When the potentiostat applied a constant current, it charged the capacitor. And when that current was disconnected, the capacitor was no longer charged and started to discharge. Now, a capacitor and a resistor in parallel forms what's referred to as an RC circuit. And RC circuits have a time constant associated with it. It is a measure of how long it takes for a capacitor to discharge. So unlike a resistor, where the potential drop across a resistor is instantaneous, it doesn't have this gradual decrease in the potential. So what we can infer is that the potential drop, the instantaneous potential drop, is due to the solution resistance, and the gradual decrease in the potential is due to the RC circuit, the working electrode interface. So we can take the potential drop, that potential difference, and then divide it by the constant current that we've been applying, and using Ohm's law, we can solve for the solution resistance. A similar technique to current interrupt is potential step. In the potential step technique, we hold the potential such that zero current flows, followed by a potential step. In current interrupt, we had a charged capacitor, but in the potential step technique, because we're holding the potential such that zero current flows, we start with this uncharged capacitor. As we step the potential, we observe this current spike, followed by a gradual decay. At the very beginning of this experiment, as we step the potential and observe this spike, the capacitor, CDL, acts like a short circuit as it's beginning to charge. This is similar to calculating the solution resistance from EIS, where at high frequencies, the impedance of a capacitor is very, very low. Now, when we select the potential to actually apply, the step potential, we must apply one that is not too high such that Faradaic processes occur. We do not want any Faradaic current in this type of experiment. In this case, if that were to happen, the charge transfer resistance would be very low. And our data would be convoluted with both charge transfer resistance and the uncompensated solution resistance. So we need to pick a step potential that is sufficiently low such that no Faradaic processes occur. In doing so, we can infer that this spike in the current is reflective of just the solution resistance. So we can take that difference in the current and the step potential that we apply, and using Ohm's law, we can calculate the solution resistance. One thing to note about both the current interrupt and potential step techniques is that both techniques require very fast data acquisition rates. We are dealing with the charging and discharging of a capacitor, and there's a time scale associated with that process. Imagine in the current interrupt technique, if I were to measure the potential one second after the capacitor discharged. Well, I'd have a very large drop in the potential, and that drop contains both the uncompensated solution resistance, but it also contains part of the working electrode interface, which is not what I want. Remember, we have an RC circuit, and that RC circuit has a time constant associated with the charging and discharging of the capacitor. So for example, if we have a 1000 ohm resistor for the charge transfer resistance, and one to two microfarads for the electrical double layer capacitance, the time scale of the charging and discharging of that RC circuit is a few milliseconds. For a few milliseconds, you need to acquire data on the tens of microseconds time scale, which is fast. It's about 100 times faster than that process. But you shouldn't go too fast. You don't need to acquire data on the on the nanosecond timescale. You don't need to go a million times faster than that process. In fact, it will actually cause some problems because you'll start to pick up electronic artifacts, such as cell cable capacitance. So as a general rule of thumb for the current interrupt and potential step techniques, make sure that your data acquisition rates are about 100 times faster than the timescale of the process 
the electrode interface that you are studying. The last technique for determining the solution resistance is positive feedback. It's important to remember that with all of the techniques we have discussed so far, the purpose of measuring the solution resistance is to determine the appropriate amount of IR compensation we want to apply to our electrochemical system. And that's what the positive feedback technique is all about. In positive feedback, we apply a series of step potentials while gradually increasing the amount of IR compensation with each step. As we increase the amount of IR compensation, the potential stat will start to oscillate and we'll then know that it's beyond the appropriate amount of compensation. In the image you see in front of you from this positive feedback experiment, we apply a minus 50 millivolt step and gradually increase the IR compensation by five ohms with each potential step. You'll notice that as we move from 30 to 65 ohms, the edges of the potential step start to oscillate and then dampen. However, past 50 ohms, we see sustained oscillations. And at this point, we know that 50 ohms is most likely our solution resistance, and we wouldn't want to apply a level of IR compensation beyond 50 ohms. In fact, we may decide to apply 45 ohms as the appropriate amount of IR compensation to our electrochemical system. This actually leads to the last section, which is on overcompensation. Overcompensation, as you can imagine from the name, is when you apply too much IR compensation to your electrochemical system. This results in two major problems. First is for a cyclic voltammetry experiment where you have a reversible one electron transfer with fast kinetics, you get a peak splitting between the anodic and cathodic wave that's lower than the theoretical minimum of 59 millivolts. If you're getting less than 59 millivolts, then something is clearly wrong. The other and perhaps more common problem you'll run into with overcompensation is ringing in your electrochemistry data, where you will start to see the current go up and down somewhat uncontrollably. Now, luckily, overcompensation is relatively easy to fix as you just have to select a lower resistance value in your IR compensation circuit. We generally recommend that you apply 90% of the solution resistance that you measured using any one of the techniques that was mentioned earlier. Of course, every electrochemical system is different, and so some trial and error is required to get the best results. All right, folks, I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please leave us a like. If you have any questions, write them in the comments section. And if you haven't done so already, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more electrochemistry content. All right, I'll see you soon.